I trust you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, you should have brought them. You know, you don't want the Baptists to put us to shame now. I tell you, it's one thing about being raised Southern Baptist. We had to have our Bibles. I think they basically checked as we came in the door. <laughs> you don't have your Bible here. You use a, a loner. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were big on the Holy Writ. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, good old Southern Baptist didn't see all of it quite uh, as clearly, but praise the Lord. They did have a lot of revelation and do have a lot of revelation on getting folk born again, so that's a good thing. Praise the Lord. All right. Turning your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. We're going to do something a little uh, different for me. And uh, I'll tell you why that is. That it is different for me. I am a teacher. I have pastored before. Pastor was talking about, you know, how long I've been in the ministry. I've been ministering since 1976. Hallelujah. I was ordained in 77. Matter of fact, 7777. I like those, I like those alliterative numbers. 7777 and then Belinda and I were uh, married on 8888. So just kind of kept that flow going, you know, praise the Lord. But um, I have pastored. But I will tell you, I think I've told you this before. Uh, I pastored, but I was not called as a pastor. It was kind of one of those situations of, here am I, Lord, send me. There wasn't anybody in the area at the time. And I found out one of the most miserable things you can do. And I had time not lying here. One of the most miserable things you can do is to pastor when you're not a pastor. Whew. I just feel for Pastor Ed so many times, hallelujah. Because, I mean, he at least has the advantage of having a pastoral anointing, you know. I did not have a pastoral anointing, you know. <laughs> hallelujah. But anyway, but no, the Lord called me in two different areas. One is as a teacher, and the other is in the helps ministry. And uh, Pastor Ed was talking this morning about Buddy Harrison, and, you know, Buddy... I've heard him teach many, many, many times. He, he, he poured so much into my life. I just am so grateful for having been able to see he and Pat minister in tongues and interpretation, as Pastor talked about this morning, but also uh, sharing his ministry and his background. Uh, something, as I heard him teach, something just clicked in me. There was a kinship with him. Uh, he had tremendous ability in the natural that God used supernaturally. And that was in helps ministry. He had uh, knowledge of publishing. Harrison House Publishing came out of his understanding of, of the, you know, the publishing industry. Um, audio, music ministry, he, boy, he just hit them all. Uh, I certainly <laughs> am not proficient in all those different areas that he was. Uh, however, uh, he talked about that when you start out in the helps ministry, very often that's kind of where you start and then you work up toward other areas of ministry. But he made this statement, I love this. He said, I know that I will never get out of the helps ministry. And no matter what he did, he was called as a pastor, he was called in so many different areas, uh, but he never got out of the helps ministry. He was always used in the area of practical aid and support in the church uh, and to many churches through Faith uh, Christian Fellowship and the, the uh, large number of churches that he helped in that regard. Uh, so praise the Lord for Buddy, Brother Buddy, I just appreciate that. But I'm the same way, I will never get out of Helps Ministry, I'm happy about that, I'm pleased about that. Um, as you know, I shoot the video most of the time and, and work with the website and the audio and, and I just love that. And I praise God that he's got me in that area of ministry. And there's an anointing in that area. Um, and I praise the Lord for that. Because when you, boy, I'm, <laughs> this has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. But I'm just sharing my heart here. Uh, when you get into what God's called you to do, in the place God's called you to do it, there is nothing more freeing, 
There's nothing more exciting. Uh, Pastor Ed said, you know, I walked in here for the first time, and, and uh, what he didn't tell was that uh, somebody else was teaching. He was out of town, actually. And uh, I came up, I, when I came into the services, I walked in, the Holy Ghost said, this is your church. You need to hook up here. Well, I don't do anything halfway. I'm whole hog. <laughs> you can ask Belinda or Ben. I just throw myself into it 100%. So we walked in that Sunday morning, heard the brother preach that was teaching, and I came up after the service, I said, this is my church, this is where I'm supposed to be. And he looked at me and said, don't you want to hear the pastor? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> so Pastor Ed preached the next Sunday, and of course I was here, and I've been here ever since. And that's been since 1988. Hallelujah. And uh, I have hooked up here, and the Lord has never tell, told me to go anywhere else. So I'm here to stay, hallelujah. Uh, got me right where I need to be. Hallelujah. So I'm just, I'm thrilled with that. I just love that. Uh, and I trust that uh, you feel the same way. You feel called to Faith and Victory Church. You want to hook up with the vision that Pastor Ed has and run with it. See, that's what it says over in Habakkuk where it says that you, you write the vision, you make it plain, and then those of us that hear that vision preached, we run with it. So that's what I'm excited about doing. I said go to Titus chapter 1. We're going to go ahead and <laughs> look at Jude 1 first. Hallelujah. There's only one chapter in Jude, so Jude 1, that's kind of redundant, but y you'll see what we're talking about here. Book of Jude... Uh, notice verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, this is the James that is, was, the pastor in Jerusalem. James, the head pastor of the big church in Jerusalem, okay? James is also the half-brother of Jesus. In other words, James' father was Joseph and Mary. Jesus' father is God. His mother was Mary. Hallelujah. So that makes James his half-brother. Jude is James and Jesus' brother. See what I'm saying? In other words, Joseph and Mary had a family after Jesus was born, all right? And uh, Jude is his brother. Well, Jude and James, they, they were around Jesus' ministry, you know, from the get-go. But they didn't know what to make of their brother that was off talking crazy talk, you know? It said of, of, of uh, Mary and his family that they thought he was a little off yeah. when Jesus was preaching, like, okay. You know, they didn't fully understand it until he went to the cross, was buried, and raised again bodily from the dead. And then they went, aha, <laughs> something going on here. <laughs> so they realized, of course, there was more to him than just being their brother, James and, and uh, Jude here. So Jude obviously saw his whole ministry play out, and then he became a very strong minister in the church in the New Testament. But let's look at what he says here. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ, uh, Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Hallelujah. Do you know we're to contend for the faith? Yeah. Amen. There's nothing wrong with contending for the faith. Now, that doesn't mean fist fights. <laughs> that doesn't mean cussing folk out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But to contend for the faith simply means make a stand for what's right and what is scriptural. Okay? You don't have to wimp out and fall back and go, well, now, brother, you know. No, that's not boldness. We are to be bold in the Lord. And as a matter of fact, Paul even asked of the, the early church, pray for me that I have boldness. He obviously was under some pressure to fold on some things. He said, brethren, pray for me that I have boldness. You know, he had some boldness. pastor was talking this morning about uh, Lester Summerall and how he was a bull in the china shop. I got to think Paul was too. 
a bit. You know what I'm saying? So uh, he, he had some boldness. He contended for the faith. But here Jude is telling the folks here, contend for the faith, earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Now verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness. Underline that. Because <laughs> that's what's happening today. Now I'll tell you this, I, you've heard me talk about greasy grace. That's the, the phrase I like to use, greasy grace. You know, there is biblical grace. There's nothing wrong with actual biblical grace. But greasy grace is that kind that you just slide around and you just get nasty. <laughs> All right. That, that kind of grace basically says, you know, I'm under grace. I can do anything I want to do. I can sin. Matter of fact, it's to the point now, it's sad to say, but it's to the point now that those that are teaching Greasy Grace, they're, they're kind of squeamish about the whole idea of sin anyway. I even heard somebody say recently, well, you know, a real Christian can't sin. I thought, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, I are a real Christian, and I'm telling you, I can sin. Okay? And I ain't proud to do it. <laughs> planning, not planning on it. But I could very easily sin if I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? Well, why don't I sin? You know, not that I'm perfect and don't all the time, but I'm saying, why don't I just run around and sin all the time? Because it would fly in the face of my Father God. I want to please Him. I want to do what's right in His sight. And I want to be a good example, and we'll find this out in just a few minutes, to others. That's important. So, for goodness sakes, don't sin. You know, as Paul said, God forbid that we use grace as an occasion of the flesh. Amen? All right. I love what he says here, because this is the key to this whole greasy grace thing. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, lasciviousness is one of those words that at first may seem a little blind to us because it's one of those good King James, you know, spiritual sounding words. But lasciviousness just means leaning to the flesh, giving in to the flesh. Okay? It is inordinate lust. Inordinate is a term that means not according to law. Okay? Now, a lot of folks go, oh, law! Don't say anything about law. Well, there's nothing wrong with law. <laughs> there's a law that I shouldn't drive more than 55 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. That's a law. It is neither good nor evil. It's just the law. It's the rules. And if I'm going to live by the rules, then I'm going to live by that law. Oh, see, you said we should live by the law. No, I'm saying I should live by the law of 55 because if I don't, the man is going to catch me. And he's going to give me a ticket and it's going to cost me money. Okay? That's just a law. There's nothing wrong with law. Now, I understand that if you try to live by the law in order to get born again, that's wrong. Okay? That's different. But there's nothing wrong with obeying the rules. All right? But inordinate desire is desire that is not in line with the Word of God. For me to desire another man's wife is an inordinate desire. And Belinda will tell you quickly <laughs> that that is not allowed. <laughs> All right? So that's an inordinate desire. That would be lasciviousness. So now how, think about this, how could the grace of God be turned into lasciviousness? Now I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but there's a lot of Christians that don't understand this. They don't get it. Because this is how this process works. Greasy grace is like greasy grace. It's, it's like you slide in. You start off with the idea of, well, you know, it's all by grace. Hallelujah. Well, it is all by grace, isn't it? Amen. I mean, what, what Jesus did for us, that was grace. What God provided for us, that was grace. God extends grace to us, that's grace. So praise the Lord. Okay, I'm with you. So since we live by grace and we're under grace, then I don't have to do anything. Well, see, now you've gone over the line. 
Now you've gone greasy, <laughs> okay? You're sliding off course. Because there's always, go listen closely, there's always going to be a God side, and there's always going to be a man side. Now, think about this with me for just a minute. If it was only grace, everybody would be born again. Even the devil. Oh, my goodness. If it was only grace, okay? Because, what does the Bible tell us? God is not willing that any should perish, but what? All would come to repentance. Now, is the devil going to repent? No. Matter of fact, he's in a class that he couldn't repent if he wanted to. He's in an angelic class. He does not have the right. He didn't have the right to do what he did. Get right down to it. That's why he was cast out of heaven. But here's the thing. If it were possible for him to repent, and he repented, eh, but he, he's not going to. Same thing with certain people. Sad to say, God is extending grace to them. They could be born again if they would receive the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord out of their mouth, believe that God raised him from the dead, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, they should be saved. They would be saved, all right? But they don't. Now, what's going to happen? They're going to be tied to their spiritual father, the devil. Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees, ye are of your father, the devil. They are going to be tied. Think of it as almost like an umbilical cord or a rope. They're tied to their father, the devil. When he's cast in the lake of fire, they're going to go with him. It's not that God's sending them there because he hates their guts. That's not the point. He doesn't want them to go. He, he gave out grace. He made it available to everybody. But they have to repent. Now, what's repent mean? Turn from the direction they were going and go in the right direction. That's what repentance is all about, is changing your mind going in a different direction. Now, the very thing then that has to happen for us to be born again, because it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the repentance factor has to happen, and that's the very thing the Greasy Grace folks are saying we don't have to do anymore. Do you see the insidiousness of that? Given that train of thought, if you go down that road far enough, you're going to wind up in universalism. Universalism is a term in theology that means everybody's going to be saved, nothing you can do about it, they're just all going to be saved. And there are people that believe that. Matter of fact, there are some people, oh my, there's one minister, I won't name his name, but I heard him in 1979, he's one of the best teachers I have ever heard. He gave one of the best messages I ever heard. Tremendous, powerful man of God, had a powerful church, and he got taken by this universalism. Matter of fact, the universalism doctrine that he ended up believing came from his association with homosexuals. Not that he was a homosexual, okay? But they took him in and loved on him, and he thought, oh, they've loved me more than the Christians do. And he went and preached in one of their churches, and I'm putting that in quotes, and they, they just took him in, and, oh, brother, you, you're, the, you're the man. And he was taken in by that and started believing along those lines that everybody was going to be saved. And he was interviewed, this minister was interviewed one time, and they said, uh, the, the interviewer, you know, said, uh, man, you, what you're preaching is, is controversial. And this brother former brother, <laughs> said, everything I'm telling you, I can disprove by the scripture. Think about this. Because, I, like I said, I heard him preach. Excellent teacher. Knew the word of God backwards and forwards. Excellent. He said, everything I'm telling you, I could refute with the Bible. And they looked at him and said, well, what about it then? He said, I'm beyond the Bible. Well, I like what Brother Hagin said. You get beyond the Bible, you, you further out than, than I am. I ain't getting out there with you. All right? I'm sticking with the Word of God. And that was his problem. He got off outside the Word of God, got this greater revelation from the Lord himself. Had the Lord Beelzebub, doctrines of devils, 
And he got so squirreled, he lost his whole church. He got so squirreled up, lost his ministry. I don't, I don't even know where he is today. It's just sad. But that's what happens when you get outside of the integrity of the Word of God. And what I'm trying to show you here is this is not unusual. This is not something that's just happening today. Greasy grace is not a doctrine that just popped up in the last 10 years. It's a rehash. See, the devil doesn't have anything new. It's all old. He's just recycling it. You know, I guess he's one of them green guys, you know. <laughs> Tree hugger. Oh, don't get me started. Anyway, verse 4. Certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Notice they weren't ordained to, to glory here. They were ordained to condemnation. Ungodly men, they weren't godly. Turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness. This is the key, and it goes on to say, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the key to what's happening today. It's all about flesh. The whole greasy grace movement is all about flesh because when you get right down to it, the main thing these folks say is, I can do whatever I want to do. That's flesh. I can drink. It's flesh. I can run around and sleep around. That's flesh. Why would you want to do all that? Why? It doesn't please God. It's not according to the Word of God. The only reason you'd want to do that is that there is, according to the Word of God, pleasure in sin for a season. But after that season, man, it's nothing but hell. It's the truth. But man, for that season, it's pleasurable. And that's what they want. They want the physical, fleshly pleasure more than they want to please the Lord, more than they want to stick with the Word of God. Like that one minister said, I can disprove everything I'm saying by the Word of God, but I got a higher revelation. The higher revelation that's beyond the Word of God is a doctrine of devils. See, what we're talking about here is contending for the faith. It's time to get serious about this. Greasy grace doctrine is probably one of the most dangerous things that I've ever seen come to the body of Christ because the people that are buying into it used to be Word of Faith people. They used to be solid. They used to be sound on the Word of God. And they've gotten squirreled off, and they don't even know it. They've gotten off into flesh and into lasciviousness, and it, it's become an excuse for them. And it says here they turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Oh, my. Now, let's finally go back to Titus. I wanted to set that all, that all up to show you that this is not something new. Doctrines of devils have been around, man, since the very beginning of the church. Sad to say. Let's look at Titus. I'll give you a little background on Titus. The epistle of Titus, and by the way, the title of the message, I didn't even talk about that when we got started, but the title of the message is uh, The Titus Times of Today. <laughs> Another one of those alliterations there. The Titus Times of Today. Okay, the epistle was named for the person it was written to, Titus, who's mentioned by name 13 times in the New Testament. And he is a convert of Paul. Okay? Titus was um, actually very sound in doctrine. He was very strong in doctrine. Now, in terms of the authorship of this book, you know, that's the thing. A lot of these things, uh, the, the dating of various when books were written, are all often contested. And a lot of people don't know. They just know ranges of dates. What I've got here is that it was written between 62 and 64 A.D. Paul was ministering to the Macedonian churches between his first and second Roman imprisonments, imprisonments from either Corinth or Nicopolis. Now, most of the, the scholars that I have been reading after this afternoon when I was looking at this seem to agree that he was in Nicopolis when he wrote to Titus, wrote this letter. Uh, most likely, Titus served with Paul on both the second and third missionary journeys. Titus, like Timothy, had become a beloved disciple and fellow worker in the gospel. Paul's last mention of Titus in 2 Timothy 4.10 reports that he had gone for ministry in Dalmatia, 
modern Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia. The letter probably was delivered by Zenus and Apollos uh, to Titus. Now, although Luke didn't mention Titus by name in the book of Acts, it seems probable that Titus, who was a Gentile, by the way, okay, he, he was of Gentile background. I always like to hear when folks who were in the early church that had positions, uh, you know, high positions, whatever, were Gentiles, because I always think, well, that's me, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I have any Jewish background. I, I might, praise the Lord if I do. But I mean, other than, obviously, the fact that Abraham is our father by the faith, and so I'm a Jew by, by faith, hallelujah. But in terms of physical blood, I don't know. So as far as I know, I'm a Gentile. And, and actually got some, got some Cherokee in there somewhere, too. About 1 16th Cherokee. So, praise the Lord, I can identify with Pastor Janie a little bit on that. <laughs> um, but anyway, Titus was a Gentile. He uh, was a convert to Paul. We see that directly from the scripture. Uh, he may have been led to the faith by uh, Paul before or during the, the first missionary journey that Paul took, which is what we're talking about, as a matter of fact, on Wednesday nights. Later, Titus ministered for a period of time with Paul on the island of Crete and was left behind in Crete to continue and strengthen the work. After Artemis and Tychicus arrived to direct the ministry there, Paul wanted Titus to join him in the city of Nicopolis in the province of Achaia in Greece and stay through the winter. Now, let's look, uh, I want to give you a little bit of that background, but let's look now in Titus chapter 1. We're going we're gonna to do something, like I said, it's a little different for me. Normally I do a topical Bible study where I just take a topic and I... <laughs> take off on a lot of different scriptures, kind of like, you know, Pastor was talking about this morning. Uh, tonight's going to be an expository Bible study. We're going to take the book of Titus. We're going to stay there. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I hope. <laughs> Knowing me, I may bounce around. But we'll try to stay with Titus and, and have an expository uh, Bible study of just this book of Titus. All right. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Don't you love that? He promised it before the world began. This whole plan was set in motion before the world began. God knew what was going to happen. I tell you what, I'm glad he had a plan. Because Adam really squirreled things up. Verse 3, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. Now this is the phrase that would seem to indicate that he is a convert of Paul, his own son after the faith, grace, mercy, and peace, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, okay, so he told him, stay here and finish this work, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So Paul himself told him, stay here and do this. Appoint elders in every city, in other words, pastors in local churches. So Titus was not only a pastor, he was a pastor, but he was also, you might say, a, uh, in certain terms, bishop, one who helped set other churches in order. Uh, Buddy Harrison, I mentioned him earlier, he, he also functioned in that role of establishing churches and, a, and appointing pastors to various churches. Okay, So basically Titus was, he was sound in the faith, he was strong in, in his doctrine. Paul trusted him enough, think about that, Paul, Paul trusted him enough to establish churches all throughout that region and establish them in the faith. That says a lot right there. For this cause I left thee in Crete, all right, uh, to ordain elders in every, every city as I appointed thee. Notice verse 6. If any be blameless, now this is the qualifications of a pastor, okay? Blameless, the husband of one wife. So, what does that say about multiple wives? Just saying. You know, there's some folks that said, yeah, I got a great revelation. I'm supposed to have multiple wives. Really? What about the Bible? <laughs> okay. Husband and one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. Oh my. There's some pastors who might have to check up on that. Not ours, hallelujah. But I have known some pastors who had some kids. 
I won't even go into that. PK, you know, is, is a title that uh, doesn't denote the best character necessarily. Okay? Just saying. But that's not how it should be. They should be not accused, even accused, of right or unruly. A bishop, or again, we substitute the, the Greek meaning here is a pastor. A pastor must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, and not given to filthy lucre. Now that's a good King James way of saying he, he's not after money. I have been, now again, oh Lord, should I get into that? Well, yeah, hallelujah. I've been around the Word of Faith message for a long time. Okay? Like I said, I started ministry in 1976, ordained in 1977, strong in the Word of Faith from uh, 77 to 78 on. All right? Heard Brother Hagin, Brother Copeland, came up, squirreled out in a few areas, of course, like any young knucklehead's going to do. Matter of fact, I got involved in something called the shepherding movement. Oh, Lord, help me. It was a mess where you had to, you know, you had to ask your shepherd whether you could basically go to the bathroom. I mean, it was crazy. Can I go on vacation this week? I don't know. I have to pray about it. Nutty stuff. But I mean, that's where I was. I was young in the Lord, you know. And uh, all of that happened right before I got into the Word of Faith. Praise the Lord. But it, and, and I'm thankful I didn't get off any further. You know what I'm saying? At least it was just the shepherding movement. It was just a brief time. And I have, was very uncomfortable spiritually about this whole had to get permission to do everything. And, you know, can I buy a car? What kind of car? Literally. I kid you not. Now, praise the Lord, they did teach the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. And I was raised Southern Baptist. And so what I heard there, there was some good there that I got. But that whole shepherding thing was just squirrely. So it's easy to get squirreled out. That's what I'm saying. And that was the particular area that I got a little flaky in, but once I got on the Word, I stu stuck with the Word, praise the Lord. And I did have a little bit of a problem in certain early years with, uh, you know, righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. We were so righteous we couldn't sin. Now, I didn't ever preach that, but I heard it. I heard that go around. And I had to kind of, I was always, yes, I praise the Lord for this. I was always, when I'd start getting off in a little something, I'd pull back and I'd go, now wait a minute, that just doesn't seem good to me. You know, I'd fall in with that crowd and they'd start teaching something and I'd go, yeah, you know, that just doesn't seem good to me. And so I'd, I'd pull back and wait a little while. And it would prove out whether it was right or wrong and then I'd go on after that. So pretty much, I'm thankful that I stayed pretty sound in those early years. Hallelujah. But anyway, so given the filthy lucre, what I, where the reason I got off on that is, I don't know what it is about Word of Faith folk. Bless their darling hearts. It is easy for them to get off after filthy lucre. Now, I know I'm telling off on us, but let's just face it. All right? What do I mean by that? I had, when I was pastoring, this was 1980. When I was pastoring, I had people come to me, Brother Bill, there's this great thing that's going to make us a million dollars. It's the way God's going to bless us. And it was, pff, one was selling insurance, another one was, you know, it was always something. And these same folks in the church would get off on that. And they'd try to pull me into it. And I even went to one meeting one time. Because they just practically dragged me bodily to this meeting. And I sat there the whole time going, why am I here? It's just because brother so-and-so is sitting over there looking like a, you know, crazy kid with a new toy. And I'm sitting here going, well, praise the Lord. And I listened to their spiel, and I said, no, thank you, I'm not interested. You don't understand, this is God's method to make you rich. Well, God can make me rich without me having to sell everybody insurance. Now, if you sell insurance, praise the Lord, that's great. I don't have a problem with that, you know. But to rope me into selling insurance when I don't know squat about it, you know, that makes no sense. And then tell me that that's God's method for making me rich, and I'm going to miss God if I get off in that direction, you know, if I don't get off in their message. 
that it just turned me flat off. Just like Amway. Now, I'll name that one. Man, that'll, that'll rope you in and suck you in. They tried to get my dad involved in that, and he literally run them out of the house. And he was not one to put up with anything. And he showed them the door and slammed it. <laughs> I'll never forget that. And then got upset because they were members of his Sunday school class in the Baptist church. I just don't understand why they come here and try to get me involved in this mess. Anyway, so I was exposed to it way early on. This kind of thing. But the, 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 the filthy lucre side of things is always wanting that dollar, the mighty dollar. I've had people tell me, you know, Dr. Bill, with what you know about technology and what you know about streaming video, you could make a lot of money going to ministers and put them on, on uh, video and getting their ministry set up and you could just make tons of money. I ain't interested. I'm interested in getting the word out. And the word of God's free. And I'm not going to charge. Now you're missing an opportunity. I don't care. God's going to make me rich and not you and your ideas. So I'm just not after it. I've turned down some opportunities because I saw pitfalls in it. I saw it set me into things. Anyway, getting off telling stories. So not giving the filthy lucre. A lover of hospitality. A lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Hallelujah. Now, as a, as a teacher, I said earlier, you know, I wouldn't call it as pastor, don't have a pastor's anointing, but I tell you what, teaching, whoo, near and dear to my heart, I am the happy, I'm happy as a clam when I'm teaching. Because the Holy Ghost clicks in and he starts teaching and it's coming through me and I'm hearing it and I'm going, whoo, this is good stuff. And it's totally outside of me. You know, I had people, somebody told me one time, oh, Dr. Bill, you just know the word so well and what you, everything you teach, you must really be smart. Well, it's not smartness. It's just anointing. You know, he teaches and I just it, let my mouth go. <laughs> you know, praise the Lord. That doesn't mean I don't study. That doesn't mean that I don't apply myself. But, you know, every ministry should do that. But I rely on the anointing. Just like a, a healing Minister operating healing relies on the healing anointing. There's an anointing to teach. And it's just as real and just as strong as any other kind of ministry. Brother Hagin loved to talk about that. That the teaching ministry, he was more anointed than sometimes just standing there, not moving a peg and just teaching. Strongest anointing he'd ever experienced as a teacher. And as a matter of fact, he loved teaching so much, the Lord basically had to get on him to, for, to operate in the prophet's ministry. He said, look, I want you to give more heed to the prophet's ministry. And, and Brother Hagin was comfortable as a teacher. He, he wasn't sure he wanted to get off into that. And the Lord had to deal with him strongly about that before he finally did. I'm glad he did, praise the Lord. You know, because his operation in the prophet's ministry before he went home to be with the Lord, wow, we so benefited from that as the body of Christ. But I also benefited a great deal from his teaching ministry. He was another one who could take the Word of God, open it to the same Scripture every time, and teach 20 messages and not a one of them be the same. Now that's Holy Ghost. All right. Praise the Lord. Anyway, holding fast the faithful Word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision. Now, what he's talking about here, the circumcision, that was, an, that was a doctrine of devils. <laughs> that was another group of squirrely folk, kind of like the Greasy Grace folks today, you had the circumcision. Now, I did a little study on this, the circumcision group here, or the Judaizers, same group. And the funny thing was, according to what I was studying, most of them, most of them weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. But they were Gentiles that thought we ought to be more like the Jews and fulfill the law and, and be circumcised if they weren't circumcised. I suspect that's why they got off in it. Because as Gentiles, they got born again and they said, well, the Jews, when they convert, they get circumcised, so we probably ought to as well. And they, they got drawn back into old covenant type operation 
And it became a real point of contention between Paul and the Judaizers. Now here's Paul. Think about this now. Paul, who learned at the feet of Gamaliel, the uh, most renowned scholar, theologian of his day. And Paul was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He knew the Jewish law backwards and forwards. He was so well regarded among the Jews that as a Jew they gave him letters to uh, arrest Christians because he was so zealous to fight against those that he believed were coming against Judaism. Paul was a Jew among Jews. I mean, he was the man. And here he becomes a Christian, gets a revelation of the Word of God, starts preaching it, and the Judaizers come and say, you should be preaching that we're under the law. And most of them weren't even Jews. You know that had to rankle him. Like, dude, anybody knows about the Jews, it's me. But I'm telling you, that's wrong. And he, there was a contention that just kept going. All through his ministry, he had to deal with it. And he says here, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped. Now let me ask you this. If Paul was our example of how a minister should deal with folks and operate in love at all times and not get out of sorts, why is he saying they ought to shut their mouths? <laughs> Think about that now. So, so far we've talked about contending for the faith that they ought to shut up. Now, if you look at it in another translation, and you know I will. Let's look at one that's really interesting, as a matter of fact. Uh, the Message Bible. I will say this, the Message Bible is a paraphrase. It is not a translation. But it does have a way of saying certain things. It's kind of interesting. Uh, let's look beginning in verse, uh, verse 9. They should be people that have, talk about these pastors, again, they should have a good grip on the message. Knowing how to use the truth to either spur people on in knowledge or stop them in their tracks if they oppose it. <laughs> Think about that. Stop them in their tracks. <laughs> stop them, Lord. For there are a lot of rebels out there, full of loose, confusing, and deceiving talk. Those who are brought up religious and ought to know better. <laughs> They've got to be shut up. <laughs> That's what it says in the message Bible. They're disrupting entire families with their teaching, and all for the sake of a fast buck. <laughs> Think about that. You know, now again, I'm not a a huge fan of the Message Bible, but I love the way that reads. <laughs> They're all just after a fast buck. One of their own prophets said it best, the Cretans are liars, and as they were in the area of Cretia there, Crete, the Cretans are liars from the womb, barking dogs, lazy bellies. There's one translation that says, they're all, uh, what was it, sluggards? But basically, they were liars, they loved to talk, and they were lazy. Now, I'm about to say something that's probably going to get me in a little trouble. I want you to think about America today and our politicians. They're liars, they love to talk, and they're lazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. But you, and you know what? They're, they're, they're raising folks up to be liars and lazy. They don't want anybody, you know, really, you get right down to it, they don't want them out there working, they want them on the rolls. All right, I done gone to meddling. That's all right, sometimes you've got to meddle a little bit. Let's go back to the good old King James. Verse 12, one of, the, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true. <laughs> Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Why? Just because you want to get after them? No that they may be sound in the faith. The reason you correct someone, the reason you contend for the faith, the reason that you try to exhort with the word of God is for the purpose of getting them to be sound in the faith. Next verse. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn them from the truth. Now this goes back to the Judaizers again, the circumcision. They were involved in Jewish fables. There are some 
scholars that believe there where he's talking about Jewish fables, that it was those who believed in genealogies, that's why he talked about genealogies, to prove their Jewish heritage. And there were even some scholars that believed that it was talking about those who followed the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. So here he's lumping it all together. They're giving heed to Jewish fables, commandments of men that turned them from what? The truth. Jesus said, uh, John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Okay? So he's turning them from the word of God, turning them from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. This is the area that I think is such a, a trap for Christians today that are getting off in this greasy gray stuff. They start off just kind of slowly buying into it a little bit, then they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they slide in and go whole hog. They get into this area of universalism, and before long, their mind and their conscience is defiled. That's when they get off in this thing, well, I can sin, it doesn't matter, it's not even sin anymore, because, you know, I, you can't sin if you're a Christian, and so I can drink and I can run around, and I'm covered by grace. You can't do that as a Christian without your mind and conscience being defiled. I'm sorry. There's no way. So, you don't want to get to this point, and we don't want them to get to this point. So there are some people we need to, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a minister one time, a friend of mine in Winston-Salem. He said, the Lord has put me, he was, he was uh, African-American, and he said, the Lord has put me in a sack-jerking ministry, and I jerked a sack out of you. <laughs> I loved that. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I said, yeah, brother, go for it. Jerk the slack right out of them. <laughs> Amen. Verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now, I'm sorry, that's what the word of God says can happen to folks. Let's go to chapter 2. We're going to try to get through this quickly. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, let's read that out of the Amplified. But you speak the things which become sound doctrine. The word become there is that is becoming to, okay? That is acceptable. So you should be speaking the things which are becoming to sound doctrine. Or, like the, uh, the King James said there, let me go back to the King James. There we go. Become like unto sound doctrine. Well, that's what we ought to be speaking. It's what the Word of God says. Not what somebody teaches. I tell people, don't, don't believe it because I taught it. Take the Word of God. Study it out for yourself. Find out what the Word says. You've got to be convinced it's in the Word of God, not just because pastor taught it, not because I taught it, not because Brother Copeland, Brother Hagin taught it, but because you see it out of the Word of God. I made the statement a long time ago, I love Brother Cope. I really do. He, he helped me in a lot of ways uh, as much or more than any other minister, and I have a great respect for him. But I told some people one time back in the 80s, you know, man, we were hot and heavy in the word of faith, and, and of course I still am, but man, these folks were too. And, and I, I raised some eyebrows one day. I said, you know what? If Brother Copeland got up in the pulpit and said, I've been fooling you folks all these years. I don't believe a word of what I've been preaching. It would not affect my faith because I see it out of the Word of God. Now, let me say, I don't believe Brother Copeland's going to do that. I didn't think then he was going to do that. What I was trying to do is shake them a bit to understand it's not the man. It's not because we have respect for Brother Copeland. I do have respect for Brother Copeland. It's not because of Brother Hagin. I have great respect for Brother Hagin and what his ministry did. It's not them. It's the message. That's why when they honored Brother Hagin many years ago in camp meeting, I was there, and they honored him and they played that song, The Message. Oh, man, I cried like a baby because he was sitting up there on the platform and, and the, the, that song talking about that what he lived for was the message. See, that was his whole life. And, and I think it was, I, 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 unless I'm misremembering, it was his 60th year of ministry, I think, that they did this particular celebration there. And the, the, 
Rama band was there and they had a big celebration. Woo, I'm telling you, that wasn't dry in the house. But when you boil it all down, that's what it was, was the message. And he would tell you as soon as anybody else, don't believe it because I'm teaching it. You find it in the Word of God. And any man, minister worth his salt will say that. So, speak things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity or divine love, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Yeah, but I didn't think we had to do any of that stuff. That's what he told them. Titus was important. He said, this is what you ought to be sharing. This is what you ought to be teaching. Not we don't have to do it anymore, but you need to pay attention to these things. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. It, doctrine is teaching. In the area of teaching, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants, we would say today, those that serve. I realized back then they actually had slaves. But today, let's take it over and bring it into employers and employees. Make it something we can understand. Exhort them to be obedient to their own masters, to please them in all things, not answer again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. There you go. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. See, that's that lasciviousness again. Deny that. We should live soberly, righteously, godly. Where? In this present world. Oh, now, Dr. Bill, that's, that's for the future. No, it's not. In this present world. He's concerned that we are sound and scriptural and don't sin in this present world. And he obviously thought it was an important thing. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know you ought to be zealous of good works. You ought to really just love being holy. Oh, there's that word again. Nothing wrong with the word holy. I know it's a four-letter word, but it's not that kind of four-letter word. All right? Holiness. Without holiness, we won't see God. I say that's pretty important. But here he says, be zealous of good works. Not say, oh, works, that's no, I'm not going to be involved in works. That's not, no, 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 zealous. We ought to look forward to the fact that we can go out there and live holy. These things speak, now look at what he says. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Did he say ease up on them? No, he said, these things speak, exhort, and rebuke. Last chapter, verse 3, uh, 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 chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to do every good work, to speak evil of no man. Be no brawlers, but be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. Hello, I just confessed it earlier. <laughs> I got off early days. We used to be that, but we used to live for pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of our God and our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing, regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Yeah, all that is true, and it all comes from him. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying that these things which, I, uh, which thou affirm constantly, that thou which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Even the folks that have been made heirs and all of these things that he says and that he shed abundantly on us through our Lord Jesus Christ and justified by his grace. Those are the folks that he says, 
be careful to maintain good works. We don't have a license to drop the good works. Matter of fact, he's saying this is really important here that we should stick with it. These things are good and profitable. Do you know it's good and profitable to live a holy life before God? Hallelujah. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and they are vain. A man that, now listen to this, a man that is a heretic, and what's a heretic? Those who have heard the word, maybe believe the word, but then they got off. They got away from sound doctrine. A heretic. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So you tell them, brother, that's wrong. Set them down. Explain it to them. Show them the word of God. They go out and do it again. All right? Set them down again. Not the second time. Explain what the word of God says. Show them what, that it's wrong. On the third time, what are you supposed to do? You reject them. Now, Paul went so far as to say, give them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. They might be saved in the final day, but praise the Lord, you at least don't fellowship with them, hang around with them, listen to their teaching, their doctrine. Get away from them. Reject them. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me in Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. In other words, I'm going to be there for the winter. Bring Zenus along and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me, salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be unto you all. Amen. So, we read the whole book of Titus. But now, isn't it interesting that that book of Titus could have been written to us today? Literally, word for word. Everything that he faced back then, we face today. Few different doctrines here and there, but for the most part, still the same things that are those doctrines of devils that we're having to deal with. But part of what I want you to see tonight as we got into this is just that very fact that we don't play around with these things. We don't look at it and say, well, you know... You just believe a little different than I do. We can still fellowship. No. If you've given them the first warning and the second warning on the third time, you reject them and you don't fellowship with them. I know that sounds hard. And that doesn't sound like the ooey-gooey love that we've heard for years and years in the charismatic movement, but that's why charismatics can be squirrelier. Because it's easy to get off in those wild, weird doctrines. We need to be sound in doctrine, sound in the faith. That's one reason I praise God for Faith and Victory Church and pastor who will tell us straight, won't hold back, praise the Lord. We need that, particularly in this day. You know, there's a reason the Word of God says that we should assemble ourselves together and so much the more as we see the day approaching. That day is the last of the last days. That's the day we're coming in on. That's why we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together so much more as we see the day approaching. We need each other. We need to be submitted to our pastor. We need to listen to the integrity of the Word of God and remain firm in it because it's easy to squirrel off if you don't. So we need to speak those things that become sound doctrine. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Praise God. I enjoyed it. We had an expository message as opposed to a topical message. 